Hey everybody, this is Coach Goodrich with another 8th grade American History uh, video lecture for you. Uh, this is going to be part 2 of Unit 5, uh, which is dealing from uh, early 1800s to right up before the Civil War time period in America. Uh, unit 1, or excuse me, part 1 of Unit 5 was about Andrew Jackson and his presidency. Now we're getting into uh, the first market revolution, industrial revolution that we're going to have in our country, um, the economic revolution, some people call it, as we begin to uh, diversify our economy in this country, first becoming a world player on the uh, world economic and world trade scale. So this is Age of Reform and Invention, Unit 5, Part 2, notes out. Here we go. So with a growing population in our country since our independence and since, our, uh, since the Constitution was put into effect, um, we have people that are needing to move not only into um, our nation, but around through the nation. So we got three main early roads. Uh, the Great Wagon Road, which connected Pennsylvania to Georgia. The Wilderness Road, which led from Virginia to the frontier of Kentucky through the Cumberland Gap. And the National Road, which led from Maryland to uh, Illinois in the Midwest. These are going to be paid for by the first tolls or turnpikes. We got them all over the place in Florida. You have to, roads that you have to pay. Uh, to drive on, uh, whether it saves some time or a shorter route or to get you out of traffic. Um, but that's how we raise the funds in order to put those major early highways into effect. Water transportation took off with the invention of the steamboat, which was made famous by Robert Fulton. Um, canals, which are man-made waterways like the Erie Canal uh, in the northern part of our country, connected two bodies of water, usually to the ocean. This helped up speed travel time for trade. Um, and then later on during this time period, you're going to have railroads. Uh, railroads are expensive to build initially, um, but their travel is not going to be affected by the weather, and they're really going to take off during and after the Civil War. And railroads are going to make travel across the country a lot easier um, during this time period. So some of the roads that we got, Great Wagon Road, Cumberland Road, and you see these little cities that popped up alongside of it. These usually were trading posts. Um, that were just there for like rest stops and for the travelers on the trade for various food items and other supplies, and they became permanent cities because of this. And then you have the uh, Cumberland Road, or this road. So this really shows not just the growth of travel in all industries, but really the tr growth of travel in railroads time and railroad times um so the 1800s yeah, if you start in new york in the little green area that's how far you could get in a day in the yellow area that's how far you could get in two days three days four days so on and so forth you know to get down to florida it would take you two weeks at least and if you go to the panhandle it's going to take you three or four maybe by 1857 thanks to our railroads you can go from new york down to jacksonville in three days you go from New York to Canada in one day. You go from New York to the Mississippi River in two days. Pretty impressive. So thanks to the railroads, really going to help speed travel up. You got uh, one of the early versions of the steamboat, and then the early locomotive here. Developing industry. Communications grow. Uh, through the growth of the U.S. Postal Service, through the Pony Express, and more importantly, later on, Samuel Morse's Telegraph. We'll do some activities with the, um, uh, the Morse, what's called the Morse code, the signals that are used to uh, communicate via the telegraph. The telegraph connected the country from coast to coast with nearly instantaneous communication. Uh, you're going to see the development in the cities particularly in the Northeast, New York City, Boston, Philadelphia, uh, mass production, textile mills, interchangeable parts are going to lead to the development of the factory system, and that brings a lot of profits, but also brings a lot of negative things like labor unions and strikes, overcrowding. Um, but this is a result of the market and first industrial revolution. The Northeast is really going to advance in terms of developing their industries, their finished products, as opposed to focusing on the agriculture like they do in the South. New technologies allowed the U.S. to force Japan and other Asian nations to open their ports for trade, which brings in a whole new flurry of goods and services with those people. Early telegraph pad, and you tap on that side. 
series of dots and dashes to correspond to letters to spin down very short um, messages back and forth. Pony Express, system of horses and riders that were scattered throughout the American West to bring uh, letters back and forth to to and to and from, from people before the telegraph uh, is very very dangerous very short-lived program and then you see the growth of the factories right here this looks like a textile industry mill growing agriculture as well so not just the industrial and business centers of the northeast down south we're going to see agriculture again people got to eat they got to have things to grow have some things to grow in order to survive so john deere yes that john deere invented the steel plow to speed up the process of planting. Cyrus McCormick invented the mechanical reaper to speed up the process of harvesting grain. Eli Whitney invented the cotton gin to speed up seeding of cotton. Um, Eli Whitney originally came up with this as a way to try and control the spread of slavery, thinking that if I create something that's going to seed cotton faster, they won't need as many slaves to work. However, it just made the cotton industry in the South more profitable, um, which allowed the slave owners and plantation owners in the south to have more money with which to buy more slaves with which to pick more cotton with which to make more money and so on and so forth uh, so it failed to diminish slavery and it grew rapidly throughout the south and southwest so, steel plow doesn't look like much but a steel blade was very very useful especially for cutting through a uh, thick almost clay-like soil of the midwest and south the mechanical reaper draw my horses here for threshing grain, and then this is what I did like a cutout section of a cotton gym. You put the cotton on one side, and then you roll it through this wheel, and it seeds out the cotton on the other. I have these little fine tools to pick out the seeds. Reforming the nation. So, with all of these expansions and changes, we are growing, but we're not necessarily getting better as a as a society. There's a lot of moral issues. Maybe religious issues, but moral issues definitely in our country. So we're, we're going to see reforms in five key areas of our social life. Because we were growing so quickly, but not necessarily in a more civilized manner, especially to the Europeans, we're viewed as hypocrites. Viewed as, you know, we're, we're selling our, this idea of an American dream, but we can't really back it up. You know, this maybe kind of still happening a little bit today with some people you know the treatment of our native americans the idea of slavery at this point which is around the world for most places was had been illegal for some time now um you know, we were viewed as a nation of drunkards and hypocrites by europe so trying to change that first one second great awakening protestant religious movement that started in the early 1800s brought about by action uh, to restore the U.S. to its moral center. Remember, we're founded uh, on the promise of being a city on a hill to show off the goodness of God, the glory of God. Very emotional, very passionate preaching. You had the big tent revivals outside with thousands and thousands of people coming. Um, like I said, tried to make the U.S. a city on the hill, found in Matthew 5.14, and this one kick-started all of the other major reforms of the day. So not only do our, does our population grow, but we also see different denominations of Christianity grow as well. Number two, the temperance movement. Because whiskey and other alcohol was so cheap, and water was usually bad or polluted and would make you sick if you drink it, the U.S. became, quote-unquote, a nation of drunkards. This led to domestic problems, problems in the home with abuse and neglect of children and wives, um, people spending entire paychecks on alcohol, uh, this was spurred on by the Second Great Awakening. Women, such as Carrie Nation in particular, began to push for the prohibition of alcohol in the United States. Carrie Nation, pictured here with her trademark tomahawk in one hand and a Bible in the other, it was like six feet tall, and she would, so which was really tall in the day, especially for a woman, and she would go into saloons with a gang of women behind her and destroy whiskey bottles and barrels and uh, fl pretty much tear up taverns and pubs, bars all throughout uh, the regions that she went. She's a terrifying figure, but very forceful. Number three, the women's rights movements really gains footing during this time. By this time in history, in America, all white males could vote. 
women were supposed to, and the expectation was for them to stay at home and be caretaker, caretakers, but this is not set well with all of them. Women such as Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Carrie Nation, Sojourner Truth, etc., began to push for women's equality and women's suffrage. Suffrage just means the right to vote. Um, most prevalent example of this is going to be seen at the Seneca Falls Convention of 1848 in upstate New York, uh, where we have the presentation and reading of the Decl Declaration of Sentiments. Um, it copies the Declaration of Independence uh, done by uh, Thomas Jefferson, almost verbatim, but it makes men the enemy and it speaks of the rights of women. We're going to be doing some comparison and contrast and analysis of those two documents as we work our way into this unit. Here's Elizabeth Cady Stanton. And then this was a newspaper article that's been clipped out like an advertisement for this convention. The convention to discuss the social, civil, and religious condition and rights of women will be held in the Wesleyan Chapel at Seneca Falls, New York on Wednesday and Thursday, 19th to 20th of July, uh, commencing at 10 o'clock a.m. Number four, social institutions. So we're talking about things that are usually going to be funded by the government. Um, by so in effect by tax dollars. Horace Mann comes up with the idea of free public education, copying that from a lot of the European countries. Uh, Dorothy Dix uh, wanted new and improved mental health facilities and care. Um, she also was a big pusher for the ideas to make prisons places of rehabilitation instead of punishment. That's why a lot of them are called penitentiaries as opposed to prisons. If you're penitent, it means that you're seeking forgiveness for what you've done. So trying to train them, uh, teach it criminals um, show them the error of their way so that they can be rehabilitated and brought back into into society as opposed to just being locked up in prison forever. At number five, and this is the big one of this day, abolition. Because of the Second Great Awakening, slavery began to be looked at as hypocrisy. Well, it says in our Declaration of Independence, all men are created equal. Well, do we really believe that? People such as Sojourner Truth, who was an escaped slave, William Lloyd Garrison, published the Liberator magazine, and Frederick Douglass, escaped former slave turned orator or speaker, began to write, preach, and speak about the evils of slavery and why it should be stopped. When speaking about it and protesting wasn't enough, some slaves, such as Nat Turner, began to plan and lead uprisings, killing their masters and other whites in an attempt to win freedom. No slave rebellion was successful for very long, and the treatment of slaves got worse as time continued. And on this topic, the U.S. truly began to split between the freer North and the slave South. One of the depictions of the Nat Turner Uprising, we'll talk more about that as we get into Unit 6. There's Frederick Douglass, Sojourner Truth, and of course, probably the most famous abolitionist of all time, Abraham Lincoln. And we see the division occur between the Green South and the blue north. All right, here you go, mini quiz. Make sure you answer this on your paper or in the packet right now and get ready to answer it on your uh, Google Classroom page as well for your grade. And I look forward to discussing this with you later on. You guys have a great day.